Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second session of the Justice Sessions. Uh, I welcome you and thank you for attending. Uh, as you probably have noticed, this is a year-long series of bi-weekly meetings on race and civil rights in Jacksonville. And um, the sessions are presented by multiple colleges and departments here at UNF, resulting in an interdisciplinary look at our regional history and how that history continues to inform our lives in the present. Before I introduce today's speakers, Whitney Meyer, UNF's Chief Diversity Officer, would like to say a few words of welcome as well. Thank you, True. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to all the departments, especially thank you to the English department for leading these very important and critically needed events here for our students, for our faculty, for staff, and for the greater Jacksonville and even Florida community. I just wanted to say that today's topic resonates very closely to me with James Weldon Johnson. Every academic year, I start off with actually talking about um, Jacksonville's history and taking many students to the Ritz Museum where they really get to hear from James Weldon Johnson himself. So it's a very special time. They have a interactive exhibit there at the Ritz. So I'm very excited to hear what um, our experts share today. What's even so special about UNF is the fact that we get to have times like these where we have experts in the field of race and civil rights and justice here on campus that we get to tap into and listen. So as you kind of see your emails and realize, hey, who is missing? Who needs to be at these discussions? Invite a friend, invite a colleague. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it back over to True, who has led this effort so much. Thank you, True. Well, thank you for those words of welcome, um, Whitney. And um, honestly, this is a uh, definitely a joint effort and it is the brainchild of, of Keith Cartwright, who is one of our speakers today. Um, Keith is the chair of the Department of English at UNF and he's the author of Reading Africa into American Literature and Sacral Grooves Limbo Gatewaves, Gateways. Prior to coming to UNF, he taught at Selma University, the College of Coastal Georgia, and the College of the Bahamas. He recently served as Fulbright Robles U.S. Studies Chair at Universidad de las Americas Puebla in Mexico. And our other speaker for today is Paige Perez, who currently serves as a visiting professor in the English department at UNF. During her undergraduate and postgraduate studies at UNF, Ms. Perez focused on the historical, social, and cultural implications of the African diaspora, including within her own family history and the tradition of autobiography and memoir within Black literature. To Page, the works of Harriet Jacobs, James Weldon Johnson, and even more modern authors like Jessamyn Ward and Paul Marshall exemplify how issues of race, gender, stereotypes, violence, and trauma are foundationally and continually shaped by the socio-political climate of America's past and present. So I welcome um, Keith and Paige today and um, I'm looking forward to their conversation with us about James Weldon Johnson. And before turning it over to them, let me just ask all of the participants who are here today in the audience, if you have questions for our speakers, please place them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen rather than in the chat window. And about 20 minutes before one o'clock, we'll um, begin a Q&A session. Um, so type your questions into there, please. And also let us know, we're trying something new today. Let us know if you would like to um, ask um, your question live, in which case just um, put live in parentheses next to or after your question. And then we'll know to allow you voice and video access um, when your question is called on. So thank you so much and um, let's, let's dig in. Muted. There we go. Uh, thank you so much, True, for those introductions. Um, I'm really quick. I'm going to share a visual that we wanted to have alongside this presentation. So hopefully it will show up the way that it needs to.
Thanks, True, for your welcome, and thanks, Whitney. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, talking about James Weldon Johnson today. Thank you. All right, so hopefully everyone can see that. All right, so to get us started in talking about James Weldon Johnson in Jacksonville, I wanted to go ahead and situate us in Hemming Plaza. So if you were here for Rodney Hurst's talk last week, this will be a little familiar. Um, so three months ago today, after standing 122 years in Hemming Plaza, the Confederate monument that erected was erected there in 1898 was finally taken down. And that monument was installed during the decade when more lynchings of Black Americans occurred than in any other decade. The monument sent a long, steady message of white supremacy, as Rodney Hurst informed us last week in speaking of the demonstrations that led to Axe Handle Saturday 60 years ago, and in speaking of the awakening resistance today. And it was less than one month ago, just from August 11th, that the Jacksonville City Council voted 16 to 2 to rename Hemming Park, named after the ex-Confederate soldier who donated that monument that you see in that picture, to James Weldon Johnson Park, in honor of the man whom Channel 4 News described as, quote, a famous civil rights activist from Jacksonville who wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing, and that the Jacksonville Business Journal identified as a notable Jacksonville Black citizen. Uh, even through my own research, but through your own, I'm hoping that you will do after this session as well. These are poorly informed understatements, to say the least. Johnson was Jacksonville's and arguably America's quintessential renaissance, renaissance man, and perhaps no American has been as deeply or widely accomplished as in many fields as our own James Weldon Johnson. So just in Jacksonville alone. Uh, James Walden Johnson was a star baseball pitcher with a badass curve, some like to say. Principal of Stanton High School, making it the first public high school for Black students in Florida. He was editor of the Daily American. He was a practicing lawyer. And he wrote with his brother, who would be what would be lauded as the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. This is just within the first 30 something years of his life. After he leaves Jacksonville, after almost being lynched in 1901 after the Jacksonville fire, so just here in Memorial Park, he went to New York. And uh, so he was a pitcher, newspaper editor, lawyer um, and principal of Stanton. And then he goes to New York and becomes an international pop star, uh, writing songs for Broadway, Under the Bamboo Tree, sells 400,000 copies in the first year. Uh, music's playing all over the world. Then he becomes, he gets tired of being a pop star. He becomes a diplomat, consul to Venezuela and wartime Nicaragua. Uh, able to do that because of the Spanish he learned in Jacksonville, which had had a strong Cuban population. After his diplomatic career, he becomes a major American author, uh, laying down the foundations for the Harlem Renaissance, the classic modern novel, The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, uh, writes major works of poetry, including God's Trombones, uh, and it's the very first anthology of African-American poetry in English. Edits the first collection of spirituals uh, arranged and transcribed by African-Americans. Writes a history of Black Manhattan. Writes a screenplay turned into a film. Writes his own autobiography. This is an accomplished man, right? Then he becomes the first Black leader of the NAACP. He becomes a co-founder of the American Civil Liberties Union. He was a vocal opponent of the US occupation in Haiti, testifying in Congress against it after visiting Haiti and witnessing occupation firsthand. He was a professor at the University of North Carolina at Fisk and then at NYU, where he taught the first black lit class to be offered at a predominantly white university. 
And along with all of this, he was an incessant and tenacious anti-lynching activist who lobbied for the dire anti-lynching bill. Now we would pause to note that that legislation against lynching was never signed into law. Uh, in fact, we had the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act sponsored by Senators Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, and Tim Scott stalled just this year and not passed due to a single senator from Kentucky. And this was all at a time when Ahmaud Arbery was lynched in a neighborhood street three counties to the north of us. We've yet to be able to pass that important law Johnson devoted his life to. So who can we think of that is, is accomplished in as many areas as James Weldon Johnson, Jacksonville's own? I can think of no single American ever. So why would two councilmen, Danny Becton, who represents District 11 right here in the UNF area, and District 12's Randy White vote against the renaming of Hemming Plaza to honor James Weldon Johnson? Why is it that folk in Jacksonville tend to know next to nothing about James Weldon Johnson, relegating his local presence to a middle school, a glorified parking lot, and a park that commemorated the Confederate soldier for nearly the entirety of its, of its existence, along with, of course, we know La Villa Museum, the Ritz works hard uh, to spread Johnson's name and memory. What can we learn by resurrecting James Weldon Johnson's in Jacksonville's consciousness? And what might it mean to read him closely today? So Johnson said some had much to say about Jacksonville. He was very proud of his hometown uh, for much of his youth. And he wrote how a city that was, quote, known far and wide as a good town for Negroes became what he called a 100% cracker town, a bastion of the solid South. In 1895, in his own Daily American, he wrote that Jax was quote, regarded by colored people all over the country as the most liberal town in the South. Pardon my use of the L word there. And by 1919, he confessed of his home in the New York age, quote, one is taken up entirely with the shame of this city. 1919 was a year of shame. This was the year after black soldiers returned home from World War I that we experienced some of the depths of white supremacist terror. Johnson called it Red Summer and led marches against the acts of white supremacist terror that were taking place in Chicago, Washington, D.C., Jenkins County, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, Longview, Texas, Bisbee, Arizona, Norfolk, Virginia, Knoxville, Tennessee, Omaha, Nebraska, Wilmington, North Carolina, and with over 200 black men killed in Elaine, Arkansas that year in a single week. 1919 saw lynchings in Jacksonville including one in which a man's body was dragged by car and dumped in Hemming Plaza. Johnson was pushing the anti-lynching bill that has still never been passed. He pushed it hard. It's the year Claude McKay wrote, If We Must Die. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. That same year, W.B. Du, du Bois wrote Returning Soldiers. We return from the slavery of uniform, this country of ours, despite all its better souls have done and dreamed, is yet a shameful land. We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. And amidst white terrorism all across the nation, Johnson wrote of his hometown, one is taken up entirely with the shame of this city. Black women's bodies been abused for so long. Solid history is shoddy and the present does us wrong. We the auntie sisters, mothers of the brothers who get lynched. Apologies. Black women's bodies been abused for so long. Solid history is shoddy and the present does us wrong. We the auntie sisters, mothers of the brothers who get lynched. 
but we get ignored when our hands are in the air over coffins, afraid to breathe or move an inch. Young bikini slammed to the cement, grown ass man screaming, we threatening, so they bring gunpowder to the wrong dwelling. A paramedic in the home through the holes can't help herself. Zero knock doorbell a warning letter to a coroner's shelf. Zora said, black women be the mules of the world, so we gotta unpack these burdens. Get ourselves to a higher position. But how we get our bodies through the door when we can't even get a word in? Calling out Orisha Yemaja, praying you haven't forgotten us. The way Christ cried out cuando le estaban crucificando. Aquí estamos todavía gritando. But silencers try to silence us. Where the knees bullets of viruses, our lids get closed over irises. So lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. That needs to become the new old anthem. When they try to divide us, beat the drums. LGBTQI plus from the girls to the boys, we need to unite and protect the souls of black folk. Yeka, if you're out there, this is the work of one of our alums uh, who got a master's here working with us. Very proud of her and the power in her work. The link to her new album is at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so that we're going to look at James Weldon Johnson's novel, The Autobiography of the Next Colored Man, uh, a little more closely for a bit. Um, this is a novel. He meant it to be taken as a real autobiography. It was published without, it was published anonymously. It's a bit tricksterish. Uh, and so he is writing a passing novel, a man who has decided that being black has too many burdens. He's light skinned enough that he can simply become a white man by not announcing his race. This novel is also an anti-lynching novel. And uh, we will get into a few scenes here before we take questions and responses. We're going to follow a call and response format, which is a, a musical tradition, uh, very prevalent in the black church and in um, popular music. But it's also a form of pedagogy that we use, uh, looking at the listening to the call of the text and offering our responses, our analysis and response in an ongoing pattern. So Paige and I are going to work through uh, this call and response format a bit. Uh, so I'm gonna read a passage. This is from the opening of the novel um, where the narrator is encountering his white father who comes to visit. I remember how I sat up on his knee and watched him laboriously drill a hole through a $10 gold piece and then tie the coin around my neck with a string. I have worn that gold piece around my neck the greater part of my life and still possess it. But more than once, I have wished that some other way had been found of attaching it to me besides putting a hole through it. So to kind of give us perspective of what is happening in this scene to Johnson's narrator, $10 worth at the time, a few years after the Civil War, that's nearly $200 today. The gold piece itself would be worth thousands of dollars. So in this moment, his father, who is white, gives his mixed race son something that is worth very little in terms of application, practical use, and instead symbolizes the promise of privilege and advancement that's never going to be fulfilled. And his drilling isn't just done, it is laboriously done. There is much effort to devalue the gift and the young protagonist is astute enough to recognize that this is an empty showing of care or affection. Yet he carries it with him for most of his life. Symbolic representation of what his identification as white will mean to him and function for him as an adult. He's also made to bear witness to this devaluing. It's almost a showing of what it means to understand micro and macro aggressions in terms of racism, the economic withholdings that encourage and keep black people in poverty, especially after the Civil War, and the daily interactions that reinforce these ideas as a state of being or consciousness on black individuals. 
as his father sits him on his knee, he says, this is what you are worth. A devalued noose laboriously created and put on by his father. A father who would eventually abandon him and his mother for a socially acceptable, proper white family. So this is the legacy from the narrator's father. This is his patrimony, a gold coin with a hole in it, an empty promise from the father, from our founding fathers, a check that can't be cashed. How does patriotism work when the patrimony has a hole in it and is not legal tender? How does society function when it is shot through with the most piercing holes? And we're gonna jump ahead a little bit in the novel here um, to when our narrator is an adult and he's actually living and working in Jacksonville. The narrator has arrived and has gotten settled and he is getting acquainted with both the Cuban and the black community at the time. And it is here in Jack's in the following passage where he situates his racial education as an adult. He, the black man bears the fury of the storm as does the willow tree. It is a struggle for though the white man of the South may be too proud to admit it, he is nevertheless using in the contest his best energies. He is devoting to it the greater part of his thought and much of his endeavor. The South today stands panting and almost breathless from its exertions. So we, we look at this text closely and we see the simile of the willow tree, the metaphor of the storm. We in Jacksonville know a lot about storms. And those of us that know much about willow trees know that they bend and pop back up. They bend and pop back up. Pine trees can snap in half. Oaks get waterlogged, get uprooted. The willow tree can take what the storm has to give all day long. What is this storm? The storm is very clearly white supremacy. It is a struggle for though the white man of the South might be too proud to admit it. He is using his best energies, blowing, blowing like the big bad wolf, uh, a huff and puff, and the willow tree back and just back and pops back up, back and pops back up. The South, and I would add America today, stands panting and almost breathless from its exertions. So he's writing this of the Jacksonville um, that Johnson knew and of the South that Johnson knew where white supremacy and Jim Crow was working so hard to keep its black citizens down, blowing and blowing the storm of white supremacy. You had to have two of everything, two school systems, two water fountains, two kinds of every single thing to show half your citizenry its proper place. Are we divided now? Think about all of the energies used in the divisiveness that we inhabit. Think about how I can't breathe. We can't breathe. We see that everywhere. And certainly many have died in very public spaces uh, with the breath choked out of them. But in another way, we can see that the South America, white supremacy is using up all its own breath, all our own resources in blowing this divisiveness and making ourselves our own worst enemies. And so Johnson's saying we can do better than this. Jacksonville can do better. The South can do better. The nation can do better. The world can do better. It's going to require unity. It's going to require that we quit blowing storms upon each other. I think he's absolutely calling for unity here as well as he calls attention to divisiveness too. I mean, it makes me think of the willow tree and its rootedness, right? The sessions that we're doing now and that we hope to continue to do remind me of that willow tree. I think Johnson would be happy that conversations are happening, even if the um, events that spur them on are still happening, but at least there's still that resoluteness, there's still that fight, there's still that call for unity as well. 
So Keith, so, you're going to take us to chapter 10. Thank you, Paige. Uh, so we arrive then at the, the moment when our narrator decides he's not going to identify as Black anymore. It's a lynch scene in Georgia. And this is, of course, an anti-lynching novel. So he's trying to make his readers really feel this terror that the nation allows or fosters. And uh, so here is from the scene. It's when a, a man's being burned alive. A great wave of humiliation and shame swept over me. Shame that I belong to a race that could be so dealt with. And shame for my country. That it, the great example of democracy to the world, should be the only civilized, if not the only state on earth, where a human being could be burned alive. And a lot of people don't know, but this particular scene or episode from Johnson's novel is very much a personal scene. As we had mentioned before, Johnson came very close to being lynched here in Jacksonville. Um, happened in Memorial Park, as I'm sure if you are a Jacksonville native or current resident, you've probably been there or have driven past it several times. Um, but there's no placard there. There's no information to even know that you're standing on that same ground where he experienced near death at the hands of racial violence. And I really want to kind of put this particular passage into conversation from his um, biography, autobiography, along this way in which he details that moment. He says, quote, I become aware of noises, of growing alarming noises, of men hallooing back and forth and of dogs responding with the bay of bloodhounds. One thought that they might be hunters. On the other side of the fence, death was standing. Death turned and looked at me and I looked at death and they surge round me, they seize me, they tear my clothes and bruise my body, all the while calling to their comrades, come on, we've got him, come on, we've got him. Kill the black son of a bitch. I feel that death is bearing in upon me, not death of the empty sockets, but death with the blazing eyes of a frenzied brute. And I give this passage because this is the shame that Johnson is referring to. That a nation that could boast of championing human rights, protecting the downtrodden, giving voice to all, would have just as easily silence the voice, not only of a human being, being deemed inferior because of his race, but one that has contributed so spectacularly to the credit of that very nation and its cultural, historical, and social presence. That his death in this moment would have been as violent and as disturbing as the lynching scene that his narrator and autobiography witnesses. That for Johnson, it is not fiction. It is his reality. It is his life. So we move to the to the end of the book, and uh, can you, Paige? Can you get us to the text? Um, yes. Thanks. He, he says this: "It is to my children that I have devoted my life. There is nothing I would not suffer to keep the brand from being placed on them." And one of the beauties about Johnson's novel and his writing, but specifically his novel is that he constantly calls us to think about the intersections of past and present. Because when he talks about this brand, he's not just talking about the South. He's not just talking about the United States of America. He's not just talking about the Americas. He's talking about the African diaspora. He's talking about the transatlantic slave trade. He's talking about the global unabashed participation in the economic enthusiasm for the slave trade at this time, the expense of dehumanizing and villainizing an entire peoples, guilty until never innocent, monster until never human, branded for life. So this brand is not just physical, it is not attributed to identifying someone as black by their features, it's not just the um, it's not just the literal branding during slavery to attribute a person to their owner so that they could be returned if they ran away. It is also Johnson imagining 
a future of that branding evolving, imagining that branding being put on his children. Um, or sorry, the narrator and imagining and they put on his children. And we see how that branding takes shape and evolves into different forms after slavery is even abolished. We get the black codes, we get Jim Crow, we get separate but equal, we get the war on drugs, we get black on black crime, stop and frisk, felony disenfranchisement, stand your ground, gerrymandering. For our narrator who bears witness to what that brand gets you, and again, I wanna call attention back to the lynching scene, but a even more harrowing description of what happens here. He says and describes the scene that the person who is being lynched cries and groans, choked off by the fire and smoke, a scorched post, a smoldering fire, blackened bones, charred fragments, sifting down through coils of chain and the smell of burnt flesh, human flesh. This is the shame that the narrator wants to cast aside. And, but in that casting aside, he also suffers the loss of rememory. He suffers the loss of being connected to the black community, to that part of his identity. He suffers and, and has to cast off any pride of his birthright. But he does it because of love. He does it because he has devoted his life to his children and understands what this brand means. He is looking at what the United States has deemed in the same document to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, but also branding part of the we of that people as three-fourths. Thanks, Paige. Let's bring it home with a look at the final, a couple of the final quotes in the book. So this is in the final chapter of the novel. This is after the narrator has already decided that he is going to pass his white for the remainder of his life. And these are two passages that are in conversation with each other as he closes the book. Quote, since I was not going to be a Negro, I would avail myself of every possible opportunity to make a white man's success. And that, if it can be summed up in any one word, means money. Then on the very last page, he says, my love for my children makes me glad that I'm what I am and keeps me from desiring to be otherwise. And yet when I sometimes open a little box in which I still keep my fast yellowing manuscripts, the only tangible remnants of a vanished dream, a dead ambition, a sacrifice talent. I cannot repress the thought that after all, I have chosen the lesser part, that I have sold my birthright for a mess of pottage. So that's, those are the final words of the novel. Um, but we go back and he's worked hard in real estate. He's a realtor. He's worked hard to make a white man's success. And what is that? One word, money. That's more and more why Everybody's coming to the university. That's even how we are evaluated on the state metrics. How much money our students in the English department make coming out. Uh, we all are so many of us working hard for that white man's success. One word, money. Seems like there's something unsatisfying here for the narrator though. Look at the words We've got the remnants of a vanished dream, a dead ambition, a sacrificed talent. If this vanishing dead sacrificiality of dream, ambition, and talent leads us, you know, to money, the white man's success, the cost is this kind of zombification. Our narrator, narrators become something undead this ex-colored man, something, something zombified. And there's a suggestion here that all of us who work to be a white man's success in that kind of narrow vision of life may well pay that cost. All of us may be caught up in that zombification to the degree that we invest everything we have in it. 
And politically, I think we can we can see some of that. And and we we love our zombie movies, right? We are all caught up in uh, the pop culture of zombification because we recognize ourselves. And so this is the narrator looking at these costs. And uh, Paige, why don't you take the final words on summing up, uh, you know, what this, how this works. I would say one thing. Uh, James Wells and Johnson believed powerfully in Jacksonville. And he saw it go south. He saw it become a, a less, less than it could be. I believe powerfully in Jacksonville. Uh, I chose to come here. I love living here. But we have, we can do so much better. We can do much, much better with what we have. And we can start by honoring James Walden Johnson. But again, back to Paige and this, this uh, sacrificiality, uh, this white man's success and the cost his narrator pays. I mean, to go off of that too, he would look at Jacksonville and say that the success isn't how popular we are, how wealthy we are, how well-known we are, how close in proximity to Disney that we are, right? Because he already tells us at the very beginning of the novel that, that the money is nothing, that it is empty, right? It's the gold piece with a hole in it, that from the very beginning, this proverbial economic noose will give him nothing, that it's a mess of pottage, it's an empty promise that America will not fulfill, continues to not fulfill for most of our citizens in this country. And there will always be more holes and there always will be more brands and there's always going to be wind blowing against the willow tree. And we hear the wind howling now we hear it, we see it with protests and outrage and police brutality and the killing and murdering of black individuals over and over again. And so he wants to call attention to Jack specifically, call us to resistance, call us to voicing, call us to these sessions and that we have to keep standing, we have to stay rooted because there's always going to be another hole, but we have the power to do something about it, to attribute our value elsewhere. Thank you all. I think we're ready to uh, respond to questions or to, to hear the audience responses. So in the Q&A box, we've got a question um, that deals with the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice. Um, and the question says, I remember reading and hearing that the song Lift Every Voice was performed for Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Was this written specifically for that purpose? Or do you think this was separate poetry that he wrote and used the opportunity to spread a good message? So it was written for a, a celebration of Lincoln's birthday um, at Stanton. And it was first performed at Stanton. So it was very much, and, and Lincoln's, Lincoln's birthday was what, pretty much what Juneteenth is, this past Juneteenth. It was a celebration of uh, black freedom. And so Lincoln's birthday meant something in black communities that it didn't, with a power that was a little extra. So yes, uh, very much written to be performed at Stanton on that day and it took off. Uh, any other um, questions or Paige, you wanna uh, add something? Well, to? Got um, another question just popped up and it's, it's a long one, so bear with me, okay? To what extent do you see the novel portraying a zombification or undead making process involving reduction to monoculture in its various forms? Values, different forms of education, expression to real estate money from the ambiguous fluid soundscape and forms of cultural contact in the beginning of the novel to the English only sad passing finale of the chameleon at the end. Paige, I'm going to leave that one to you. 
Yeah, I guess I'll take that one. Um, so I think we kind of see that progression, especially in terms of the idea of zombification with how many kind of roles the narrator goes through as he goes through the novel. So there is a scene we did not talk about um, in our talk today that is actually one of my personal favorites um, from Autobiography where he has to learn that he is Black. And it is something that is also a, a very popular narrative in the experience of Blackness, right? It is it something that you are, um, uh, uh, born knowing you have to learn it someone teaches it to you and from that moment on his identity is is never one thing or it is never stagnant and it's not that he doesn't want the stability it is that because he is black especially during right after the civil war that he has to constantly change himself and his identity um, part of that is getting um, acquainted with, with music, writing it, performing it. But it is also in the way that we see him go to Jacksonville and then have to start all over because someone has stolen his money and then he cannot go to university. Um, it's the way in which he goes to New York and encounters different aspects of prejudice and racism there, even though the larger narrative is that the North didn't have that, right? That's what we all learned in high school. Um, and he imbues himself and, and gets acquainted with different aspects of his identity surrounding all of these di different things, art, um, culture, um, different groups of people. And we see that at the end, he can't even take on any of these if he wants to live that is the matter of survival. Um, and I think ultimately what Johnson is trying to, to say in terms of that identity and, um, and that uh, transformation as he goes through the novel, that it doesn't, it doesn't matter all of the, the roles that he tries on or the things that he's interested in because he is black and if he wants to survive and he wants to live and he doesn't want his children to um, be witness or like Johnson was himself almost be a victim of racial violence then he cannot even engage in any of that um, and he has to shed all of it. I would say we, that answers the question too. We see something of this vis-a-vis -vis Jacksonville the more we read Johnson. We see his parents came over from Nassau from the Bahamas to a Jacksonville that had a huge Cuban population. Uh, very Jacksonville in Johnson's youth was much like Miami is now. And uh, we see a Jacksonville that became after uh, Woodrow Wilson was president and Jim Crow comes in harder and harder, becomes a black and white town, uh, a less a, a town with fewer wide open avenues. And uh, becomes more like the rest of the solid South, becomes zombified a bit. Uh, and, and Johnson represents this restricting of, of identity and possibility in Jacksonville and bails and goes to New York, but always has a love for his city. Uh, so, uh, I think we see Jacksonville as a character going through some of the, some very similar things here. Um, another viewer asks, why do you think schools are not actively teaching students about Jacksonville's history? Why is it that students have to wait until they get to college and they're able to make these class selections to find out this information about the city they've lived in their whole lives? I mean, I'll take the first there's first part of this one. I know you you probably have a different answer than me or maybe similar. Um, so, I mean, I grew in, from my bio. I was born in Jacksonville and um, raised here for the majority of my life and um, almost went to James Walden Johnson Middle School. And my introduction to James Walden was through chorus because Lift Every Voice and Sing was a staple of um, 
our choral repertoire. And even in singing that, that song, there was really no larger talks and not um, to the, the detriment of the instructor, but um, no larger talks about who he was. And I think it all has to do with the shame that comes with that. Because when you talk about James Walden Johnson, and if you just focus on lift every voice and sing, um, then that's kind of the positive aspect of it. It's, it's black culture, it's black music, it's black pride, it's black heritage. And then when you start delving into his works, right? You get into autobiography, you get into his um, works as an activist. He was fighting against a ugly, ugly part of our past that historically, nationally, we try to sweep under the rug. So you can't not talk about James Weldon Johnson as in depth as you would in a classroom without acknowledging all of those things that we don't acknowledge as a country alone anyway. Um, I mean, I'm just glad that my chorus teacher made Lift Every Voice and Sing as, as big as we did um, because it started on that conversation or at least me wanting to learn more about him. Um, but that wasn't until high school. And even then it was everything that comes with who he was and how vocal he was about racial injustices in America. And just those conversations are not had. Um, and I think it largely has to do with, with um, especially his, uh, his work for anti-lynching, especially. And I think we see it even in the resistance to renaming him in Plaza after Johnson, uh, which you know passed finally 16 to two, but it took a while to get to the 16 to two. And I wonder how the two even voted against it. If James Weldon Johnson with all those accomplishments, I mean more than Thomas Jefferson in, in, a, in a variety of ways, I can think of no American with such a variety of accomplishments and such a depth of accomplishment. If, if he were a white man, half of Jacksonville be, would be named after him. Uh, it comes down to the fundamental issue of racism and to the ways we diminish our own minds and apprehension of ourselves. If, uh, if we can't celebrate the greatest public figure that Jacksonville's ever produced, who can we celebrate? If James Weldon Johnson can't be known and we can't be proud of our own, who can we be proud of? We become set to be losers. You know, a whole city of losers if we cannot honor such accomplishment from our own. That's how self-respect begins. That's how Jacksonville, and I'm a Jaguar fan, so maybe even the Jaguars one day won't be losers. But we have to honor our own. We have to take some pride, and that may take facing some shame. It may take looking at things that are tough and that we, don't, we aren't ready for. But if we're not ready now, I don't know when we'll be. And to that end, what do you think the first steps are that we take to start appropriately honoring James Weldon Johnson? This is, this is one I would love to be able to talk with everybody and open, open it up and, uh, and be right there with everybody. Certainly the renaming of Hemming Plaza is one small step. Uh, I think we're gonna hear Lift Every Voice and Sing performed before the Jaguars game this Sunday. These are just small, basic things. We've got a long, long way to go. Um, but reading Johnson's a start. Uh, Getting to know what he did and what he wrote is a start, but uh, Jacksonville's own are gonna have to determine this and the, and the youth are gonna be determining this. Aisha, what do you think? You, you grew up here. Um, reading him for sure. I, I don't think that I really appreciated what he taught me, especially about Jacksonville and living in Jacksonville until I read him. Um, and I mean, even not just his novel, I mean, from just our list from the beginning of this, of this talk, 
I mean, he has so much, so many other works. So if novels aren't your thing, check out his poetry. If you like nonfiction, he literally has essays and essays and essays talking about all kinds of different um, perspectives on the country during that time, culture, um, Black heritage. Uh, he did musicals. You want to watch a film? Watch a film. I mean, there's so many ways that you can share James Walden Johnson, um, regardless of what medium you prefer. Um, I, honestly, maybe start with a poem. I start with a poem. Start with something short. Um, you know, dip your feet in and then, then go from there. I mean, he has plenty, he has plenty of work, um, to choose from. And in the age of the internet, <laughs> extremely accessible. To what extent did James Weldon Johnson see hope and promise in the youth and their ability to affect change since y'all were just talking about the youth? I think I'm gonna give this one to you, Cartwright. Yeah, um, he was always hopeful. Uh, he was hardly a cynic. Um, always put his best self forth. Zora Neale Hurston called him King James for his demeanor. <laughs> and uh, he simply the fact of his output and his energy shows someone who was an optimist, who believed we were gonna do better and helped court that path, make that path possible. And uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing was quoted by Martin Luther King in addressing, in the last public address King ever gave to the Southern Christ Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, he closed out or opened, I can't remember which, his last speech to that group, quoting Johnson. Um, Barack Obama's inauguration had a quote from Lift Every Voice and Sing in it. So there's always this uh, more perfect union dreamed of. I think uh, we in Jacksonville could have a great opportunity to uh, honor this and to lay some claim to our own uh, most accomplished citizens. Um, so, yeah, Johnson n never gave up and was never given over to abject cynicism. I would also say that his hope also comes with a large dose of reality, too. He did not turn his face away to horrors. He did not um, put it into pretty words that we could make ourselves feel better at night. I mean, even just listening to his descriptions of lynchings, I mean, he was going around the country, following up on those real life events over and over and over again, and then writing about it and sharing it with people. So, I mean, and it really calls to mind something that Hearst said uh, two weeks ago that stuck with me was that no one is ever too young, especially black children, to talk about race and to talk about racism. And I think Johnson very much would, would agree with that um, in the sense that he, he never minced what could happen to anybody of any age who was black in this country during that time. And I don't think he would mince what can happen now either. And I think what's probably going to be our last question, because it is a longer one. <laughs> um, why wouldn't Jacksonville see towns like Austin or Richmond and simply want to recognize Johnson's work just for the tourism angle? Hmm. It wasn't that long, but there was a lot of parentheses. <laughs> so. I honestly, I don't. Um, I don't want to repeat too much of anything I said, but I feel like when things are, are touristy, they're very packaged in a way um, in how they're marketed. And I think because Florida is largely marketed as a, you know, sunshine state, it's 
it's it's beach country it's disney it's miami and it's it's very much like you come here to escape reality you don't come here to be confronted with reality um i think maybe that's why possibly james walden johnson doesn't necessarily fit into the narrative of florida as a tourist um at least what we built as as florida tourism um but yeah i don't know car what do you think well his home in la villa and much of la villa was just uh, paved over and beat you know wiped out uh so there's a parking lot there now where people uh, gather for jaguars games to ride the buses you can see uh, it on google maps so there's there's an absence of memory. The one place we ought to have a, some commemoration up is the St. John's Episcopal Church. His mother was kicked out of that church for uh, when she came to it, she was singing. She was used to going to, Epis to uh, Anglican churches in Nassau and she showed up at that church downtown and was shown the door. Uh, so we, but who wants such a commemorative plaque that uh, we showed a good Christian the door uh, from this church uh, in, you know, 1888. So part of this tourism journey would be an utter indictment of many, many actions and, and uh, a tough, tough journey. I think there is a, they, they do this around in Jacksonville. I think Rodney Hurst has been part of it. Much. People uh, around June 17th on his birthday do a commemorative bus tour. Really appreciate the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, these justice sessions are gonna keep moving forward. And uh, you know, we can, Jacksonville has a lot to offer and we all collectively do. And uh, so uh, we're gonna be teaching James Weldon Johnson here at UNF um, steadily and supporting people, teaching them in the public schools so uh, Duval can uh, has stuff to do, but thanks. Well, yes, thank you everyone. Yes, yes. and I will just um, close us out by thanking the panelists again, um, Paige and Keith. Uh, thank you so much for your really brilliant analysis of James Weldon Johnson's work and the important connections between his work and the legacies with which we now contend in our nation and in our city. Um, I think you've given us new ways of looking at this legacy and um, drawing inspiration from a man whose life was dedicated to fighting for a better future, for that more perfect union, as Keith reminded us. So thank you again. Thank you for all who have joined us today. We look forward to seeing you back in two weeks um, on September 23rd, when our topic will be um, Jacksonville Consolidation. So thank you. Be well, everyone. <laughs>